good evening. We're doing a late night wrap up. It's not really even that late. It's like <laughs> it's 7 11. Welcome to my January wrap up. I'm so glad to be bringing you another one because I asked in the last one if you guys would like me to continue doing these and you were like, yeah, duh. <laughs> Is that even a question? Please keep making them. So I'm going to keep on keeping on with the wrap ups. I am very excited to bring you my little entourage of books that I read in January. Small-ish but mighty pile because I thoroughly enjoyed myself in January with what I read. I had a really good reading month um, and I'm here to tell you about the batch of books that I read. I had a really, really good time and like my goal this year is kind of to like not read any bad books and I was on a streak. I was on a streak and then one book came along and kind of ruined that streak. But overall, this month was just filled with four star after four star after four star. No five stars, but we're still on the hunt. The search continues. I might be in the middle of a five star right now. I'm not really going to talk about it in this wrap up because I'm still reading it, but also throughout the month of January, I got halfway through almost The Count of Monte Cristo by Dumas, which Carolyn and I are reading for our Game of Tomes book club for January and February if you want to join along. Very exciting news coming soon concerning this book club, so keep your eyes open, your ears open. I'm like a priest today if you have any sins to confess to me. Um, Let's hear them. Put the most heinous thing you've ever done related to reading or the book world down below in the comments. What have you done? Have you ripped out pages of a book? Welcome, my children. <laughs> let's, let's get into this reading wrap up. Okay, first of all, I read a book, speaking of priests and religion and different taboo topics, I guess, is kind of what this is relating to. I read an audiobook. I listened to an audiobook that I found on Libby completely by accident, and I would really, really like to shout this book out first. I hope you're still watching at this point. I hope you listen to this book review first, because this book only has around like 250-ish reviews on Goodreads, and I think it deserves so much more. I thought this book was amazing. It was phenomenal, and that book is regrettably I am about to cause trouble. Of course, the title really caught my attention. I think it's a really cool title. And I was like, ooh, what is this? The cover's cute. It is by Amy McNee, and this was so fun. If you're looking for one that is very witchy, but witchy in a very interesting way, I feel like I could talk for hours at length to someone else who has read this book and just go over everything and I want to like pick their brain. As the title kind of suggests, we have this young woman who is about to be married off to a suitor. She is very well off. Her name is Maudlin, Maudlin Shaspery, and she lives with her very well-to-do family. She is the only daughter in her family. Siblings are all boys and so she is a disappointment because this is set in Tudor, England under the reign of King Henry VIII. At this time, the queen is none other than Anne Boleyn. So she is about to be married off to someone who's going to help her ascend the ranks of the Tudor court, and she's like preparing herself to go into this life of popping out babies, pleasing her husband, and just kind of doing things in Tudor England, which are very much expected of her. And she doesn't really have any other life experience. So Maud is a woman who is so deeply entrenched in all of the conventions and the traditions and the cultural expectations that are placed upon her and she very much wants to uphold these things, fit in, do a good job, and just excel at being this definition of woman that has been foisted upon her. So regrettably, I'm about to cause trouble is kind of about her journey breaking down these barriers. However, it's incredibly funny. It is so incredibly funny. I think Amy McNee is so good at just kind of unveiling the absolute absurdity of so many situations. Like this book gets into the nitty gritty of like what goes on in these marriage traditions in Tudor England. We have Maud's whole like inner monologue going over her wedding night, different things that are happening, and it is absolutely obscene. It's horrific and cruel and terrifying, but it is so deeply funny because Maud is just such a gorgeous narrator. You laugh so much at what she's going through, but you're also like, oh my god, like this is deeply horrific. Maud's trouble because the marriage does not go well. In fact, she gets an annulment, as the synopsis says. No spoilers. Her problem? Well, it's not really her problem. It's kind of every everyone else's problem with her is that she has this huge birthmark running like up her inner thigh to her stomach, and everyone thinks that it is a mark of witchcraft, that it means that she is a witch, her husband included. So when her husband sees this, he's like, oh my god, you hag, you have cursed me, I shun you. And he files for 
divorce. A number of factors kind of happen that Maud uh, doesn't really have too much opportunity except to run away from this whole situation. She takes herself off to the apothecary in town where the wise women are said to live. So similar outcast types to what she has now become. There are two women in the shop. They are fantastic characters. I love them. They act as kind of new mother figures to Maud, and I just love this whole freaking journey. Yes, it's a cozy book, but also it deals with so much. And also the witchy aspect of this book is what I loved so much because it's not a typical fantasy. It can't really be categorized or pinned down as wholly one thing because it is historical fiction. It also obviously branches off from history and does its own little thing, but what I loved about the witchcraft written into this book is that it is so ambiguous and that so much of the time you see that like the witchcraft is really just girls being girls. It's just girls being girls and other people just not having it. I love how it interweaves like the fantasy aspect and the malignant aspect and the religious terror of witches alongside like Maud and the wise women of the town literally just making tea. And I love- oh my god, I just love the exploration so much. Maud is maybe not a very sympathetic character, certainly at the beginning, but I think that her character development, the character arc that she goes through, it is so believable. It's so well done and you really just truly- I don't know, you feel for her at every step of the way because of course she has all of this internalized hate going on for a number of different groups of people, but you see kind of her eyes begin to open as she becomes one of the hated, as she becomes an exile and an outcast and a person on the fringes of society who has to operate in a completely different way. At the end of it, I just wanted more. Like I simply just wanted more. Like I said, it's not a very long book, so chef's kiss. I, I don't know what else Amy McNee has written. I look like a Puritan. Why do I look like a little Puritan farm boy? I'm looking like I'm about to be the person holding the witch trials, but I loved, regrettably, I'm about to cause trouble. Spoke to my heart and I really, really enjoyed it. So four stars, highly recommend. The next book that I finally finished in January, I started this book in December. This is supposed to be a December Christmas read for me, is Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies by Heather Fawcett. You guys know I love Heather Fawcett. It's true. And I still do. And this was a big hit. This was a big hit, but it didn't knock me out. It wasn't like a, it wasn't like a KO. Also, I don't know what the heck is wrong with this cover, but it's like coming off and I don't think it's intentional. Like the lettering and the design is, is coming off from where I've just been holding it. Which is just a little sad. Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies is about this professor named Emily. She works at Cambridge. She's very closed off. She's so closed off. She's very awkward and she is quite sensitive. She doesn't really have a way with people at all. She just doesn't get it and more than that, she doesn't want to get it. She's closed herself off from a variety of relationships, different kinds of relationships, and she also studies Fae. She's like one of the top scholars in her field studying Fae, which very much exist. Um, or at least, you know, she's she's one of the ones trying to prove their existence and map their identities and different kinds and species of fairies. So this book opens in fantasy Iceland. It's Iceland, but it's not Iceland. So obviously I ate that up with a spoon. Ooh, it was good. I will say it was good. I loved the winter imagery. I loved the snow and the depictions because the fae that Emily is trying to look for in Iceland are quite different. They're very elusive. They're maybe a little evil and they maybe have not so great intentions with uh, the village and the villagers. Lo and behold, she is soon joined by none other than her academic rival who is just very exuberant and self-involved and egotistical and his name is Wendell and they have like a love-hate relationship but also Wendell kind of seems to be the only one who maybe understands her, maybe accepts her for who she really is and also pushes her at the same time to kind of, you know, cast off this like iron armor that she is always wearing. They just explore Iceland looking for Fae. I like this and at the same time this took me like over a month, almost two months to read. So that definitely says something. What does it say? I think to me, it says that the plot might be a little bit way too meandering for my taste. It might've been a little too slow, even for me. And I love, I love slow. I love coziness. I love getting just like really sunk into a book that, you know, doesn't really have any fast paced moments at all. This one does, but I will say that at times it felt like the plot 
didn't really know where it was going. I should say that Emily Wilde is written in Emily's journal entries, so of course it starts off very scientific as she starts to document different creatures that she's meeting, different patterns, which is all very interesting, but I think because it's written in journal entries, I just didn't find that it really lent itself to getting too involved with the book at one time. I found myself getting quite exhausted if I sat down to read this for long periods of time. It just kind of lost me in moments. This book also comes with footnotes, which I usually love. Like, I love fantasy books especially, which come with footnotes, and because this is more of like a scholarly spoof on the world of academia, like you can see there's like footnotes, um, it was cool. What I will say about the footnotes is that I think they could have been done better. They're kind of just inserted very haphazardly, randomly, and eventually they seem to trail off, which does mirror like Emily's own personal journey, like getting away from academia, not being embroiled so much in like theories and her head in a book and like actually engaging with a wider community and connecting with people. But I just found that I think like the encyclopedic nature of it all could have been handled better. I think it either should have been like you should have, she should have leaned into it and like really made it an encyclopedia because this book isn't the encyclopedia. You just get Emily's journal entries, which are then going to be put into her encyclopedia of fairies. I just think the format of the book maybe made it a bit less enjoyable and that's probably why I didn't give it the full five stars. She's great. She's an incredible writer. That is not the problem at all. I just think the format of this one didn't lend itself to the same amount of enjoyment and like pizzazz. At the same time though, I did really love all of the characters. I love the relationships in here. You like Howl's Moving Castle. A lot of this reminded me of Howl's Moving Castle and especially the relationships in there between the main characters. Very Howl's Moving Castle. Even down to sometimes like the descriptions of how they like physically look. I still gave this four stars. I still re really enjoyed it. Um, I'm still gonna read the sequel. I loved it and I'll just leave you with like this one winter quote that I enjoyed. The forest has a different quality now girded with winter. It no longer dozes among its autumn finery like a king in silken bedclothes, but holds itself in tension, watchful, and waiting. In moments like that, I am reminded of Gautier's writings on woodlands and the nature of their appeal to the folk, specifically the forest as liminal, a middle world, its roots burrowing deep into the earth as their branches yearn for the sky. And then, I'm sorry to say, we have the book that, like, interrupted my month of four stars. A very rude interruption that I probably should have just DNF'd. I've gotten so skilled at DNFing books. I'm so proud of myself. Unfortunately, I did not let this one go, probably because I just wanted to see what the ending was gonna be, and probably just for like egotistical reasons, because this book is called Alias Emma, and I just felt, I just felt it to the protagonist that I, that I had to, I had to bear it out. I had to read it. Um, uh, this one obviously also caught my eye because it has my name in the title. I also found this one on Libby. I listened to this on audiobook. And as you might have guessed from the honestly ugly cover, don't like the cover, Alias Emma is a spy thriller with not a lot of thrills. No thrills. Let me go on a rant about this book. Let me just tell you briefly what the synopsis is about. And then I think while I go on the rant, I just want to show you the, um, little crafts that I was able to make while listening to the audiobook so that it wasn't like a completely wasted experience because I've been listening to more and more audiobooks so I've been doing increasingly more and more crafty things. So let me just give you the synopsis and then I'll go on a little, on a little rant. Okay. Julius Emma is a British spy thriller following Emma Makepeace. First of all, you are in M MI6. You're in MI6. Your spy name is Emma Makepeace. I just feel like that's such a glaringly obvious, first of all, fake name, but also if you're like on a mission and people are looking for like weird names or names that have some attachment to like a spy job or a government job or something, Makepeace, I feel like that's just going to stand out like a sore thumb. And like, obviously, if you're a spy, you're going for total anonymity. I don't know. I just thought it was a little silly and also cringy. Emma is a fairly newly minted agent in MI6. She's like, of course, a prodigy. And she finally gets like her first, I guess, real mission this one night. So there have been a string of deaths in London of uh, people who used to work for the Russian government working on like nuclear stuff, I think. 
oh my god i forget they're all like just kind of dying in broad daylight and mi6 is like well this isn't good like we gotta fix this emma is assigned to this one young guy named michael his parents are russians who are now living in london because they've been protected by mi6 and michael unlike his parents is very stubborn and is refusing to take the asylum like go to a safe house like get out of the public eye because there is a target on his back so emma is sent in to convince him he has to give up his whole life and everything he's working for he is a pediatrician he really loves his job and his mind in his mind he's like you know what? i put these kids lives above my own life like i just want to help them she steps in which is just supposed to be like a retrieval convincing michael to just like come with her come to a safe house things go off the rails um all of london's like c cctv is that what it is as she's trying to convince him to come with her all of london's cctv cameras get hacked i didn't really know this i mean i had only heard of like their f i guess it's a famous camera system i don't know um on like sherlock <laughs> so but i just looked it up and there are over nine hundred and forty-two thousand five hundred and sixty-two cctv cameras in london meaning there is one camera for every 10 people and it says you are likely to be captured on london cctv up to 70 times per day they just have like mass surveillance i guess so it's not good that their all of their cameras get hacked um so then all of a sudden emma is tasked with like bringing michael all the way across the city to the mi6 headquarters in one night while they are being pursued relentlessly by different agents who want to do them harm okay so basically this book is pretty much only set across one night which i typically don't like and i typically dislike that fact even further when the book is so so boring that it fails to capture my attention at all it's not thrilling this is a goddamn spy novel where was the intrigue where was the action where was the i mean there was action but it was just all so boring i can't tell you enough how dull this book was i made a bunch of mushroom diamond um art while i was listening to this audiobook so i'm just gonna go through and and show you my diamond art while i tell you the sins that this book has committed okay so First of all, when, okay, so Emma and Michael, as they try to traverse London, here's exhibit A. Isn't it cute? Oh, beautiful. As they traverse London, they kind of get closer and closer. They're around the same age. They're both quite young. And as the novel goes on, like she just keeps revealing pieces of her real life and her real identity that she should act, like you're a spy. That's like, that's like rule numero uno. What are you doing? She is just telling Michael like huge pieces of information. And for half of the book, I am like suspecting Michael of not really being a good dude. And I'm like suspecting him of, of some involvement. And I'm just watching Agent Emma over here spill her whole life story to this guy that she just met. And I'm like, you were hired by MI6. There is no, like, are you dumb? Here's the next one. Cute. This is good. This is like stamping down my rage a little bit at this book. These are really beautiful. Oh. She even goes so far as to tell Michael her real name. Anyway, as you can imagine, a tentative, like, I guess, romance blossoms between them over the one night, which is, like, never resolved. So many points in this novel are never resolved, and it's just so annoying. Like, there's intrigue about potential people within MI6, like, interior suspicion circulating. Um, and all of it is just so repetitive and so blah. The whole book becomes, how can we get across London on foot, by the way, and like not get seen by these cameras? That is pretty much the whole novel is just evading being paparazzi. It's just like, oh, we're getting attacked by foreign agents. Oh, we got out. Oh, we're getting attacked by them again. The writing itself, coupled with like the actual events in the book are also equally uh repetitive i was in the mood for a very i don't know stereotypical spy novel and this was just so so dull look at this one though Ooh, purple i just really feel like i i literally feel like i missed something with this book i just don't get it because the ending happened and like i guess there was a twist but not really because it was just not even twisty and it was i don't know things just weren't really tied up and i was so disappointed with alias emma so disappointed don't recommend let's get back to the good stuff next in january i read the mill house murders by yukito ayatsuji this was so 
good. This was very, very good. If you guys have not seen it, I'll link it up above, but my brother and I filmed the whole solving this murder mystery video. It was very fun. My favorite one that I've done to date. This was so fun. This one, I just feel like we put a lot more work into this video. The book, I think, was just such a good experience. It felt actually solvable in contrast to some of Agatha Christie's works, which will not be named, which I feel like had some, I don't know, had some not very solvable aspects to them, but The Millhouse Murders is so cool and such an enjoyable read. I found it so addicting. This is about a man who wears a rubber mask at all times. He is also partially paralyzed, so he is in a wheelchair. His name is Fujinuma. He lives in the middle of the forest in this very, very isolated mill house. He's kind of taken himself out of society after a car crash 12 years prior to the start of the story that left him very scarred in more ways than one. This car crash also had his best friend Masaki in the car and Masaki's fiance who tragically died in the car accident. Fujinuma also lives in the forest in the mill house with his wife along with a bunch of his father's paintings, pretty much all of his father's paintings because Fujinuma's father was a well-renowned artist. Every year, because of these paintings, Fujinuma puts on a gala, an event in his home where only four people are allowed to come and see the paintings. So the Millhouse Murders switches between two timelines, one in 1985 and one a year later, where we have these people come to the house to see the paintings and murder murder happens. One stormy night, the tranquility of his retreat is shattered by gruesome murder, a baffling disappearance, and the theft of a priceless painting. So in the second timeline, in the present timeline, we have a detective show up on the scene and he just starts poking around being like, you know what, the things that were labeled accidents, the things that were labeled what they were may not be as they seem, and we set about kind of solving the actual theft of the painting, the accidents, the murders. It's really good fun and it's so well done. I don't know, I just feel like it's everything a murder mystery should be. It's spooky, it's twisty, it's believable. There's a lot of foreshadowing. Reading it through a second time, which I don't know if maybe one day I will do because there's just so much there. I think the two timelines are very, 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 very cool. My first Ayatsuji, this was an author that a lot of you guys recommended. Thank you so much. I cannot wait to read more from him and hopefully solve more murder mystery videos with him because this was just honestly so highly enjoyable. Four stars. Loved it. Finally, the last book that I read in January. I read this for my world tour book club, which I host with all of you who are on Fable, reading along with this book club where we read a book from every single country, or we're trying to. We'll see how it goes. But January for me was a success. This book had a bunch, a bunch of different reactions. People loved it, people hated it, people, a ton of people were in the middle ground. I, for what it's worth, gave it four stars. I really enjoyed it. It wasn't a perfect read for me, but it had so many elements that I just love to discuss and I love to poke around in. First book for our World Tour Book Club was For Mexico, and that book was Like Water for Chocolate by Laura Esquivel. Esquivel, sorry. This is good. I thought going into this that this was like a very happy fable, fairy tale-esque story, mostly about like family and cooking, and it is, but it's it's really truly not very happy at all. First off, I just want to say that I wish I had the opportunity to read this in school. I wish I had the opportunity to read this in university. There's so much going on in this book, and I would have loved the opportunity to write something about this. Maybe I still will. I don't know. I just feel like there's so much in this book. So the general premise is that we have the youngest daughter of this family living in Mexico, close-ish to the border with the United States. We have Tita, who is the youngest daughter, like I said, to kind of the tyrant matriarch of the family. Mama Elena. In her family's tradition, it is the destiny, the sad destiny of the youngest daughter to never marry, never have her own life, and to care for her aging mother until the day that she dies, and on top of that, just kind of be a general servant of the household. In Tita's case, this is cooking. She has to cook uh, pretty much day and night for everyone in the house and care for Mama Elena, who is really awful, abusive mother. Like Water for Chocolate is also a wonderful book of magical realism. Really enjoyed the magical realism bits. You guys know I'm such a huge fan of magical realism. This was great. Um, our main girl is born very early because her mother is cutting onions, starts to be affected by 
onions that are being cut, the baby comes out crying and like floods the whole kitchen. And this is kind of how her connection to the kitchen and to food begins, which is at the heart of this whole book. To talk about the magical realism aspects of like food and cooking, because that is where the magical realism most comes into play. Food is such an art form. It's an art form like any other. It's a creative process like any other. And of course, it's an art that you literally consume. And so what we start to see in like Whatever Chocolate is that the meals that Tita begins to prepare, they start to have different consequences and affect the people that she's feeding in different ways. Our main character makes it literally possible for her family and for others to survive because she feeds them. She's providing them with the building blocks that they use to build their physical being. It starts to become this really, really profound thing um, and the specific meals that she cooks, whether it's because something in her life is happening or she's feeling a certain way, the food starts to shape events um, in increasingly magical ways. Each chapter in Like Water for Chocolate also starts with a recipe. So it comes with obviously the ingredients and somewhere worked into the chapter. Um, this book is just split throughout the months of the year the chapter will tell you step-by-step -step instructions on how to prepare the dish. So this book, this novel, is also a cookbook. And the dish that is chosen for each chapter just becomes so symbolic of what is going on in the story at the time, what is going on in Tita's life at the time. And you can like, you can push this, you can push this as far as you want to even like the minute details, the step-by-step -step instructions for cooking, like the way that you chop something, the way, I don't know, the manner in which you add ingredients one after the other, it, different cooking methods, different cooking actions like become incredibly suggestive and it's so cool. It's Water for Chocolate is also, I guess, a romance and a love story, although I really that was probably the aspect of the book that I enjoyed the least. I didn't really care too much about Tita and Pedro. Pedro is our love interest, one of them. And what happens like in the synopsis, essentially because our protagonist is the youngest daughter, she can't marry. And so what Pedro decides to do is to marry her older sister so that he can always be close to Tita and always be in her household. So it's just really this complicated web of affairs between all of them. Uh, there's also a eldest sister who I just loved. Like Water for Chocolate is also set against the backdrop of the Mexican Revolution and there is so much going on between the revolution and the events leading up to Mexico's new constitution in 1917 that parallel the events going on in the family. For example, Mama Elena as this big tyrant whose order um, you know, we hope to overthrow and hope to create this new balance. I just, it's cool. It's just cool to follow her journey, especially growing up with such an abusive family and her just creating different relationships. I loved all of the different relationships in here. I especially loved the eldest sister. She was really cool. She's the one who begins to fight in the revolution and all of this kind of comes to a head when the new constitution comes out and says that, you know, men and women, at least under the law, are equals. Writing is a little bit distance. It's a, it's a third person, very distance narrative, but I think it just works so well because I find I feel like more often than not in magical realism, for example, definitely very much in 100 Years of Solitude, it's a lot of telling, but it really, really, truly works. And in these cases, I feel like the actions of the characters just speak so much louder and speak so much for their feelings, for their inner worlds, and particularly the magical realist events that happen really symbolize the inner workings of the person and like what's going on inside of them so I didn't mind that at all I think it really worked for this style and I just I just liked it I gave it four stars I think the writing was great also justice for John I think everyone agrees in the fable book club that we're just we're here for justice for John poor John it's like water for chocolate I loved it I loved reading this alongside you guys for January I'm very excited to keep reading around the world with you in February and I hope you enjoyed it and if not then I hope the next one is right up your alley. So that is the last book that I read in February, also a four star in January. That is it. This is the end of the video. If you made it all the way to the end, leave me, I don't know, leave me a cooking utensil. Leave me an eating utensil, a kitchen utensil, something like that of your own choosing. And I will see you in a new vlog on, I think, Friday. I think I'll see you on a new vlog on Friday. Until then, love you guys so much. Thank you for watching. Ciao.